So the titled the sermon this morning, All in This Together. And, well, I'll explain more about why I named it that as we go along. Um, first, I wanted to read two statements from a wonderful book, The Desire of Ages. Um, the first, starting on page 48, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature. Even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden, but Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. And then in the next paragraph, Satan in heaven had hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him the more when he himself was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners. Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. So it, it, was, a, it was a high stakes, uh, high stakes sacrifice when Christ came to this earth. It was possible that Satan could have overcome Christ, but by uh, depending on his father, Christ was not overcome. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. You know, and as a kid, um, it's not unusual to look at the begats that start there and just kind of skip over that section, starting in uh, verse 1 and all the way to verse 17. So uh, we're going to be looking at several verses there. But first off, give me some examples of some heroes in the Bible. When you think of people that are real heroes in the Bible, who might that be? Hmm? Joseph, that's one. That's a good one. Uh, Moses is the David. Yes, it's mm -hmm. Elijah, Daniel, mm -hmm. Esther, Jael. That's another one. Mm -hmm. So those are all heroes in the Bible. Uh, I just put six here: Joseph, Moses, Isaiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel. Um, but you know what's interesting? Not one of these people appears in Christ's genealogy. None of these people, and like with Daniel, we, there's nothing recorded um, about Daniel making any mistakes. I'm sure he made mistakes, obviously, but that's not recorded in Scripture, which is interesting. But he's not in the, in the uh, genealogy of Christ. Um, they, most of the genealogy, or um, much of it is focused on kings uh, and royalty and so forth, but a few names are left out. We're going to go to verse 5. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Now here's an artist's rendition of the story of Rahab. Um, what was Rahab's profession? She was a prostitute or a harlot. And yet she, by faith, listening to when the 12 spies came, um, she believed what they said and believed God, and that was counted to her as righteousness, as it says in Hebrews 11. So she's going to be saved. We'll talk to her in heaven and be able to find out a lot more of all the amazing things that God did in her life. Then we also have in that same, going back, uh, in that same verse, verse 5, we have the story of Ruth. And Ruth was a Moabite. And she, the, briefly, the story is she, um, her, so it would have been her mother-in-law um, was a Hebrew, and uh, her husband, who ended up dying, was also Hebrew, and she went back with her mother-in-law to Israel, and she was accepted into God's people. But what does Deuteronomy, um, excuse me, I skipped a spot here. So Genesis 19, 36 through 38, where did the Moabites and the Ammonites come from? So thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father, and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. 
So in the story is, you know, Lot and his wife and two daughters set out from Sodom, and his wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt, and so they went to this, near this little town of Zoar and went to a cave, and the daughters thought, well, we need to have an inheritance, and uh, they got their father drunk, and they were both conceived children by their father. That's incest. That's not a very good uh, thing at all. That's a terrible thing. And yet, this is also someone who's in the lineage of Christ. Now, the Moabites uh, and the Ammonites uh, had their own gods. Moloch um, was the god of the Ammonites. Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. Baal was another Canaanite god. So, here we have uh, what Deuteronomy 23 says, verse 3 and 4. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way, when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee, Balaam the son of Beor of Pithor of Mesopotamia to curse thee. So the Moabites were cursed. Now had there been ten generations uh, since this had happened uh, to Ruth's time? I didn't know either, but it turns out there had not been 10 generations. So why was Ruth accepted into the people of God, even though 10 generations hadn't gone by? It was because she repented and she turned from idolatry. So even when God says, you know, someone is to be excluded, it's not a final thing. It's only because of idolatry and their choice to continue on in wrong behavior. This is a picture, an artist rendition of worship of Molech, just to give you kind of an idea of what we're talking about here. So as you can see, the idol there with the arms outstretched and the two men building a fire behind it, the idol of Molech would get so hot, those arms would be red hot. And then they would place a child sacrifice on there that would be burned to death and scream in terror. And because that was so traumatic and nobody wanted to hear that, they have all this loud music, these drums and trumpets and all these distractions to try to, to not have you think about this child sacrifice and how terrible it was. So, and this is, what, you know, this is why God said the Moabites and the Ammonites are not to be uh, in my congregation unless they repented. Yes, sacrificing children. So then here we have, continuing on in the genealogy in verse 6, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Urias. So that story of David here, it even mentions Solomon and David's fall. And it came to pass, this is in 2 Samuel 11, 2, and it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So here's David. He's home from the war. The army is all out to war, and David was supposed to be the head of the army, wasn't he? But he decided to stay home and, I don't know, take it easy a little bit, and here he fell into temptation. So then in 2 Samuel 11, 3 and 4, And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. So here David essentially raped Bathsheba. Um, he took her, which was wrong, completely wrong. And so then uh, it turns out that she's pregnant a verse or two later. And so he tries to come up with a way to solve this problem. So first, he, uh, uh, I don't have it here, but uh, first he calls Uriah to come home and, uh, you know, why don't you go and visit your wife so that if he goes and spends time with his wife, maybe this will all work out and no one will know what really happened. But Uriah is a very honorable man and he says, I cannot go home to my wife when my soldiers are out on the field of battle. And so he sleeps in the street. And this isn't what David wants. So David gets him drunk and tries to, to get him to go home that way. Still doesn't work. So finally, he comes off with another solution. 2 Samuel 11, 14 through 15. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. 
So here Uriah is carrying his own death warrant. I mean, how terrible. And, and Joab is also complicit in this, and he experienced consequences in his life and ultimately was executed as a result of his sin. And so Uriah takes this letter back, and sure enough, he is there in the forefront of the battle. He was one of the best soldiers of David. And everyone else retreats from him, and he's left there, and he's killed by the Moabites, or the Ammonites, excuse me. And so David goes on for a little while and uh, thinks he's gotten away with it. But then he, he, and he takes Bathsheba as his wife, and he thinks he's gotten away with his sin. But then Nathan the prophet comes and says, Thou art the man, tells a story, uh, and David condemns himself to death, which was too harsh of a punishment for the crime that Nathan described of stealing the, the lamb. But David has an experience of true repentance. In Psalm 51, which is one of the most wonderful psalms, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I'm not going to continue on with Psalm 51 for lack of time today, but that's a wonderful psalm to read through and really spend time thinking about and uh, prayer over. It's a wonderful psalm, what true repentance looks like. And there was something else about David's repentance. He didn't keep it a secret. He talked, to it, he talked about his sin and his repentance to everyone. He told all Israel how he had been wrong. And so... There was true evidence of repentance in his life. And God blessed that even though he experienced some consequences also and some, this seed sown in his family uh, brought forth terrible results. So we have the story in 2 Samuel 13. Amnon, who I believe was David's firstborn son, um, raped Tamar, who was his half-sister, and that was Absalom's full sister. So in uh, verse thir or chapter 13, verse 14, Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. So here th there was a cousin who came up with this whole elaborate plan to pretend you need food and you're sick and not feeling well and ask your sister to come and feed you, and yet he took advantage of his sister, which is another terrible crime. So in 2 Samuel 13, verse 20 and 22, And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. So David was very upset at what had happened, but did he do anything about the situation? He didn't do anything. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. So Absalom hates his brother now. So what, what is that? What's another word for hating someone like that? Isn't that bitterness? That's bitterness. So uh, Absalom is developing this tremendous bitterness. And then what happens next? We have Absalom's rebellion. So the bitterness turns into open rebellion. He plots against his own father. Um, he also murders his brother uh, at the beginning, uh, Amnon, for the terrible thing he had done to his sister. And uh, Absalom has uh, a whole rebellion planned out, and he has an advisor. Remember um, how um, Bathsheba was the son of uh, Eliam? Mm -hmm. So we look in 2 Samuel 23, 34, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. And who was Absalom's counselor? Wasn't that Ahithophel? Yeah. Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. So not, not only was Absalom bitter about what had happened in the family, Ahithophel was very bitter over what had happened to his granddaughter because Bathsheba had been wronged. And so Ahithophel, in the process of giving all of this counsel, gave Absalom some advice in 2 Samuel 16, 21 through 22. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. 
What roof was this? This was the same roof of the palace where David had looked out and saw Bathsheba. And so here, David does a terrible wrong, and Absalom, in bitterness against his father, rapes ten women instead of one in the front of all Israel, very openly. Here's a, a picture of Solomon. But, you know, because of David's repentance, who is the kingdom passed on to? Solomon. It was Solomon, the son of this... Uh, the, uh, the son of uh, David and Bathsheba. It wasn't the child that Bathsheba was uh, pregnant with uh, initially. That child died. But here we have, unfortunately, Solomon then, after being the wisest man to have ever lived and doing so much good, he married all these different wives for alliances, these strange wives, as Scripture puts it. So in 1 Kings 11, 7 through 8, Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. So what kind of sacrifices were these? And to, to idols, and they were children too. And I, I, the scripture doesn't say, but I'm sure it didn't immediately start with child sacrifice, but that's where it went. So, you know, here we have Moloch, Chemosh, and Baal again. Here's that same picture of the terrible, terrible child sacrifice. So moving further down in Matthew 1, verse 10, and Ezekiah, so there's another name for Hezekiah, begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias. Does anyone remember Manasseh as a king of Judah? Was he a good king? He was the worst of all the kings. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. So, and Manasseh was terrible. I mean, Scripture records it, child sacrifices, all sorts of idol worship, uh, desecrating the temple, everything. It was terrible. And, and this is someone in the line of Christ. But is that the end of the story with Manasseh? Let's turn to 2 Chronicles 33, 11 and 12. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Uh, some other versions speak of this as though um, it's the concept is Manasseh had like a nose ring put in, uh, like a cow would have to be, you know, really humiliated and hauled away to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. So Manasseh turned back to God, and we're going to be talking to Manasseh in heaven. So even the most evil of all the kings was, he repented. That's right, he repented and turned back to God. And it, it will be a really interesting conversation between Isaiah and Manasseh because Manasseh was the one who had Isaiah sawn in half in the midst of his evil, you know, the prophet of God. So, you know, the, the reason to cover each one of these stories, and they're, they're awful. Um, I didn't cover the story of Judah and his daughter-in-law and that awful story as well, um, but there's, there's so many to cover we don't have time because the genealogy of Christ is filled with sinners, just like you and me. Um, you know, in my own life, when I was about, uh, I don't know exactly what age I was, but a neighbor boy introduced me to pornography. Um, and that was something that had a real hold on my life until I understood from a, listening to someone speak that I had to go and talk to my parents. So I confessed the, that sin in my life to my parents, and through understanding that, through understanding Scripture, claiming the victory and having Christ work in me, I have victory over that terrible sin. But, you know, there were consequences in my life that uh, I have experienced because of those things. And one of the hardest things is when you look at your kids, you know, you know that your sins are going to affect your kids. And I have passed on inheritance of sin to my children. And so one of the difficult things to do was talking to my children and saying, you know what, I have committed these sins. I have done these things, and so I have given you the genetic propensity to do these same things and to have struggles in these areas. 
and would you forgive me for doing that? And they graciously forgave me. You know, my children are very sweet, but it was a terrible time, and they cried, and it, it hurt them to know what their father had done. But here we have in Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, it was a new thought this week as I read this. I never thought about it before, but where is there more grace than any other place? What does it say? Where sin abounds. So God pours out His grace even more where there's sin. I never thought about it like that before. That, that is the message of justification by faith and sanctification in our lives that Christ wants to bring about. So grace, and that one definition for grace, is a desire and power to do God's will. Because do we naturally desire to do things right? Do we naturally desire to follow after God? No, we want to do wrong. We don't want to do God's will. We want to do our own will. So as we, even in repentance, is the gift of God. But God is graciously, you know, God's far more merciful than we are. We look at what someone else does and say, oh, that's awful. I'm glad I'm not like them. But God doesn't look at us that way. And he wants to give us the mind of Christ so we don't see each other that way either. Amen. Then I want to cover something I kind of call the three nines. Um, turn to Ezra chapter 9. There's three chapters in the Bible, and this is why I entitled the sermon, All in This Together. There are three chapters in the Bible that all have prayers in them. And these prayers have a very interesting characteristic, all in common. Now, we're not going to read the entire Isaiah, uh, Ezra chapter 9, um, but we're going to read verse 6 and 7. And said, O oh my, and this, this is uh, Ezra praying, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. Now, was Ezra guilty of these things? And, and as the prayer goes on, it talks about, you know, taking wives from the heathen. Was Ezra give, uh, guilty of these specific things? No, no he wasn't. That's right. Uh, uh, he was identifying with the whole group of God's people, that we have done this together because we don't do anything in a vacuum. What one does affects us all. You know, a great illustration is of like a, uh, let's say, like a tour bus. You know, I, as a church, we're all together in this tour bus. And if I'm driving uh, and I drive like a maniac, uh, is that going to affect everyone? Yeah. <laughs> if I drive off a cliff and <laughs> crash over the guardrail, is everyone going to be injured and maybe killed? Yeah. That's the way it is in the Christian church. We're, we are together in this. We're not alone. And so what one does affects everyone. So Ezra identified that. Then let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Um, that's another uh, long prayer that's very, very beautiful. I encourage you to read these chapters uh, later on your own, the whole chapter. We're just going to focus on verse 32 and 33. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. So here again, was Nehemiah you know, a terrible um, transgressor who had turned away and gone to idols? No, he was the one coming back that God had sent to rebuild uh, Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, and he's identifying with God's people again, like you said, corporately, as the whole body of believers, we have done wickedly together because we all affect each other. Then on Daniel 9, let's go to verse 4 and 5, and this is another beautiful prayer that I encourage you to read the whole chapter. 
in verse 4, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Now, as I said earlier, nothing is recorded in Scripture of Daniel making any mistakes. So he is again, not that he didn't make any mistakes, but uh, he is again identifying with God's people. Then in verse 18 of the same chapter, O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations, and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So here Daniel is just pouring out his heart to the Lord and and identifying with God's people, and he didn't have any righteousness of his own. He recognized that, that it's only God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. And what happens right after this? And I, I had forgotten this until I was studying it this week. Then Gabriel comes immediately, and what does he tell Daniel about? It's the 70-week prophecy, the prophecy of the Messiah. That was the answer to that prayer. Then uh, in verse uh, 20 and 21, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So here is that angel Gabriel and then sharing the 70 weeks prophecy after that. You know, I, I share all, all the stories about the terrible things that were in Christ's genealogy to give us all hope, because no matter what we've done, because we've all made mistakes, they're not all the same mistakes, but we've all made terrible mistakes. And, you know, some are more public than others, some are more private, but we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we need the Lord. Amen. There's a story I want to read. Um, it's a very interesting story, and... Um, this is a very, very encouraging. So I'm going to read this story. If you live on the East Coast and travel to Hawaii, you know that there is a time difference that makes 3 o'clock in the morning feel like 9. With that in mind, you will understand that whenever I go out to our 50th state, I find myself wide awake long before dawn. Not only do I find myself up and ready to go while almost everybody else is still asleep, but I find that I want breakfast when almost everything on the island is still closed which is why I was wandering up and down the streets of Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning, looking for a place to get something to eat. And as we all know, it's hard to find anything to eat at 3.30 in the morning, if you've been up then. <laughs> up a side street, I found a little place that was still open. I went in, took a seat on one of the stools at the counter, and waited to be served. This was one of those sleazy places that deserves the name Greasy Spoon. I mean, I didn't even touch the menu. I was afraid that if I opened the thing, something gruesome would crawl out but it was the only place I can find. The fat guy behind the counter came over and asked me, what do you want? I ordered some food for breakfast. He poured me a beverage, wiped his grimy hand on his smudged apron, then grabbed a donut off the shelf behind him. I'm a realist. I know that in the back room of that restaurant, donuts are probably dropped on the floor and kicked around. But when everything is out, fr uh, uh, but when everything is out front where I could see it, I really would have appreciated it if he had used a pair of tongs and placed the donut on some wax paper. As I sat munching on my donut and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner suddenly swung open, and to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocative and boisterous prostitutes. It was a small place, and they sat on either side of me. Their talk was loud and crude. I felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard the woman sitting beside me say, Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. Her friend responded in a nasty tone. So what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? You want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Come on, said the woman next to me. Why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. Why do you have to put me down? I was just telling you it was my birthday. 
I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should you give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party my whole life. Why should I have one now? When I heard that, I made a decision. I sat it and waited until the women had left. Then I called over the fat guy behind the counter and I asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. The one right next to me, does she come here every night? Yeah, he said, that's Agnes. Yeah, she comes in here every night. Why do you want to know? Because I heard her say that tomorrow is her birthday, I told him. What do you think about us throwing a birthday party for here, right here, tomorrow night? A smile crossed his chubby face and he answered with measured delight. That's great. I like it. That's a great idea. Calling to his wife, who did the cooking in the back room, he shouted, Hey, come out here. This guy's got a great idea. Tomorrow's Agnes' birthday. This guy wants to, to go in with him, wants us to go in with him and throw a birthday party for here, right here, tomorrow night. His wife came out of the back room all bright and smiley. She said, That's wonderful. You know Agnes is one of those people who is really nice and kind, and nobody ever does anything nice and kind for her. Look, I told him, if it's okay with you, I'll get back here tomorrow morning about 2.30 and decorate the place. I'll even get a birthday cake. No way, said Harry. That was his real name. The birthday cake's my thing. I'll make the cake. At 2.30 the next morning, I was back at the diner. I had picked up some crepe paper decorations at the store and had made a sign out of big pieces of cardboard that read, Happy birthday, Agnes. I decorated the diner from one end to the other. I had that diner looking good. The woman who did the cooking must have gotten the word out on the street because by 3.15, every prostitute in Honolulu was in the place. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes and me. At 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open and in came Agnes and her friend. I had everybody ready. After all, I was kind of the MC of the affair. And when they came in, we all screamed, Happy Birthday. Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open. Her legs seemed to buckle a bit. Her friend grabbed her arm to steady her. As she was led to one of the stools along the counter, we all sang happy birthday to her. As we came to the end of our singing, happy birthday, dear Agnes, happy birthday to you. Her eyes moistened. Then, when the birthday cake with all the candles lit on it was carried out, she lost it and just openly cried. Harry gruffly mumbled, Blow out the candles, Agnes, come on, blow out the candles. If you don't blow out the candles, I'm going to have to blow out the candles. And after an endless few seconds, he did. Then he handed her a knife and told her, cut the cake, Agnes. Yo, Agnes, we all want some cake. Agnes looked down at the cake, then without taking her eyes off it. She slowly and softly said, oh, look, Harry, is it all right with you if I, I mean, is it okay if I kind of, uh, what I want to ask you is, is it okay if I keep the cake a little while? I mean, is it all right if we don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged and answered, sure, it's okay. If you want to keep the cake, keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Can I? She asked. Then looking at me, she said, I live just down the road a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home and show it to my mother. Okay? I'll be right back, honest. She got off the stool, picked up the cake, and carrying it like it was the greatest treasure in the world, walked slowly toward the door. As we all stood there motionless, she left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, What do you say? We pray. Looking back on it now, it seems more than strange for a sociologist to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner at Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Agnes. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished, Harry leaned over the counter and said, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? In one of those moments when just the right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Harry waited a moment, then he answered, No, you don't. There's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. There's a postscript to this story because 
here this man does a nice thing for this prostitute in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. Then what happened to Agnes? I became friends with Harry and Jan from that night forward and keep in touch with them whenever I get to Hawaii. Agnes gave up the street walking life shortly after that time. She ended up going to work at that diner. And she, Harry and Jan, have turned that diner into a place where people come for help day and night. The word is around town. If you're in trouble, go to that little restaurant. The people there will listen to you, talk with you, and help you if they can. Sometime later, his birthday is February 25th. He was speaking at a college in Oregon. And the he came in on his birthday. Thank you. And the place was decorated with balloons, streamers, banners, and there was a sign that said, Happy birthday, Tony. Agnes, your friend from Honolulu. She had, she had somehow found out when my birthday was, where I would be on that date, and contacted some officials and students at the college and set this up for me. So here, this one act changed this woman's life. As he says... Here, the reason why this story clicks is very simple. It does what Jesus does. It takes Christianity outside of a religious institution, outside of the church, outside of the stranglehold of the religious environment. Once you get the truth of God out of the church and come up to its bare realities, its impact of loving care rings true to people. And I don't know where we got the other one, speaking of the church, that is half country club. You know, we're all in this life together. We've all made mistakes. And just like that one act that changed Agnes's life forever, we have the opportunity to do that in other people's lives. We've all made terrible mistakes. We don't want our church to be half country club. We want our church to be such that anyone is welcomed here, no matter what they've done, where they've been. This is, this is a church for everyone because God loves everyone. And don't be discouraged. In Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall weep. We shall reap if we faint not. Because as I mentioned with you know, Isaiah talking to Manasseh, sometimes we don't know what the effect will be. Sometimes we will end up talking to people years later that we did one kind thing and we impacted their life for good. Others we may not find out anything about until heaven. But whatever it is, it, it is worth it for Christ. And I want to make an appeal this morning. If there are things in your life that you know that God wants to take out of your life to change your heart, no matter what it is, and you want to make that commitment to Christ anew, even if you've been a Christian your entire life, I just ask you to stand this morning with me as we pray. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your amazing grace. We have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. Our only hope is your salvation, your justification, your faith. We have no other hope except for you, Lord. We are prisoners of your hope. I just pray that you would encourage each person here today, and especially those that have stood we, Lord, we want to do things your way. We don't want to do our own will anymore. It's so easy to just go about according to our, the way we think we should do things. But, Lord, we want to do it your way. Not I, but Christ. Work in us and through us to accomplish your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.